I'm here today with Dr. Neil Bernard, who is the head of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. He's also started the Barnard Medical Center in Washington, D.C. He's quite a prolific writer, and he's written so many books, and one of them is The Cheese Trap, which I just absolutely went crazy over. And this book really had a, a profound effect on me, and we're doing tonight the part five of our series. So thank you very much for meeting with me again tonight. Thank you. Glad to be doing it. So I had a viewer write in. He is a gentleman from India, and he wanted me to ask you, he said, where he grew up, so many people drank milk every day. And we had talked in one of our previous videos that there's a, a link between milk, dairy products, the casein in it, and cancer. So he wanted to know why didn't he see a lot of cancer growing up? Yeah. Well, it's a fantastic question. First of all, it should be said that sometimes we see other problems first. Weight problems often come in early and heart disease and other cardiovascular diseases may come in early too. So in a population where, and I don't mean to necessarily say this was the case in, in his area, but if, if people are having heart attacks, pick them off in their 40s and 50s and 60s, they may not live to get cancer. The cancers that are particularly linked to milk, prostate cancer is probably the, the biggest one. Mm -hmm. and some evidence of other hormone-related cancers as well. But I think the main issue could possibly be that other health uh, issues are eclipsing the effect on cancer. The other thing I might say is that it, it may... India is a very diverse country. In some parts of India, milk is just every day, and it's something that's very much defended. In other parts of India and, uh, and in certain demographic groups, much, much, much less. And so in a comparison to, say, Northern Europe or the U.S., where dairy is a pretty big thing, particularly hard cheeses are a big thing, the comparison might be a little bit different. So um, that's not a very thorough answer, but that's probably as good as we can do. Okay. Well, some people are allergic to milk. I mean, lactose intolerant, it's, that's clear cut. But other people have observed that when you consume dairy products, it seems to exacerbate and make other allergies worse. Why is this? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. And it started out just as an observation. You've got a kid with asthma and the kid gets away from dairy and the asthma goes away or gets a lot better. And then you happen to notice that kind of unrelated to that, that their cat allergy got better and their allergy to dust got better and their hay fever got better. It just all went away and nobody really figured it out. But the, the thing is, they weren't necessarily allergic to milk, but they, the milk seemed to make seasonal allergies and pet allergies and dust mm -hmm. allergies worse, and it made their asthma much, much worse. So what we presume is happening mm -hmm. is that somehow the milk products, particularly the proteins in the milk, are somehow sensitizing the immune system to go on hyper alert so that it might have let that pet dander go by before, but now with the milk proteins making everybody alert, you're gonna react and you take the dairy out and now your immune system could calm down and just let some of these innocuous things go by. So, but, but I encourage people not to take this on faith. If you've got allergies, if you've got asthma, if you've got a whole lot of sensitivities, get away from dairy and just see for yourself if, if you do better. I have to say in my own life, that happened to me where I used to have a cat allergy not severe, but I would pet a cat. And then if I might touch my face, my eyes would kind of itch. And I, you, you, you could feel a sort of a classical mild allergy. Got away from dairy and all animal products. Don't have any cat allergy at all. Now, sometimes allergies just go away on their own. So if you're thinking, well, it could happen, but it might have been a coincidence. You can always challenge yourself. Go back and eat all that cheese and stuff for a month or two. Pet a cat. See if you got a problem. Ah, okay. Well, I even know, like, if I got sick, I mean, growing up and, and I had a cold or something, that if I consumed any kind of, like, milk or dairy products, it just exacerbated and made the cold yeah. worse. So, and I remember uh, that. There are a lot of people, uh, many people react to dairy in with respiratory symptoms. And when I say the respiratory tract, I mean everything from the mouth to the lungs and even the ears, because as you know, through the eustachian tubes, the, ear, the ears are connected. And so you're on a, an airplane and you're landing at Cincinnati. And as the plane is going down, all the little babies start screaming. Oh. And 
And, and they're right say, around oh, me. They strategically yeah. place them all around me. They do. Well, they, they put you right in the middle because they know you're a calming influence. Mm, um, yeah. But, but the, the issue we fear is that the kids are having that their ears are a little bit swollen from the dairy. And so they can't equilibrate the way other, others might. And the answer may be just don't give kids dairy products. And a lot of things get better, including that one. Well, why is it that dairy proteins trigger so many of these respiratory problems? Okay, well, the first thing that, that's important is that we do, we do believe it is the protein. You know, in, when you and I have talked before, we've been indicting the fat, right. the cholesterol, the sodium, the hormones, and those are all big problems in, in dairy, especially in cheese. But now we're not talking about that. We're talking about the protein. And that's important because a lot of people say, well, okay, I will have skim milk mm. instead of full fat milk. But skim milk has the protein more concentrated with all the fat removed. But, but you ask, uh, why does it happen? Uh, what we believe is going on is the body recognizes it as a foreign protein and our bodies have to decide which proteins am I going to react to and which not. Mm -hmm. So oatmeal, uh, green vegetables, I'm not going to react to those. Those are food, but a bee sting, uh, that's something I'm going to react to. Th things that are are harmful to the body. The body just does mount an immune reaction to them. And dairy for many is in that category. You're, after all, think about it. We are great apes. Why would we ever be exposed to the milk of a ruminant animal? It just yeah. would never have happened, except people are creative and they figured out how to invent a dairy industry. Yeah. I mean, when you just stop and think about it, we're consuming the lactating fluid of another species. It's like, ew. Yeah. Well, I, apart from it being kind of creepy, it's also biologically a very strange thing that it's sort of like, I mean, th there are certain populations that are just always isolated from each other. The mollusk at the bottom of the ocean and the bird in the air, their biology is never going to mix. So mother nature figured, okay, these are sensitizing proteins, but if I stick them in the udder of a cow, a great ape is never going to touch them. Ah, was she wrong? Um, people figured out how to make cows stand still and then they milked them and took their milk and started drinking it. And then you have people having reactions to it. Wow. Yeah. So what about migraines? Can cheese be a trigger for these like horrible headaches? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know, it, yes. Very often. It's, it's a common thing. And by the way, a migraine is not a stress headache. If a person has a headache, it's the end of work. They haven't had dinner. And after half hour or 45 minutes, it goes away. That's not a migraine. A migraine is mm -hmm. pounding pain. Yeah. It lasts all night long into the next day and you are sick. I, I mean, nauseated yeah. with it. Um, it's awful. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's debilitating. And there are people who have these on a regular basis and you can't read, think, study, do anything except wait in the dark for the darn thing to go away. Migraines, May, uh, all migrainers have read or, or found through personal experience that many foods trigger migraines and, and not just foods. It can be lack of sleep. It can be seasonal changes. Sometimes they come prior to a woman's cycle. There's, there's a lot of things, but cheese is one of the classics. And many researchers said it's aged cheese. Mm -hmm. Aged cheese, cheeses and along with meat and chocolate have a compound called tyrosine mm -hmm. that gets into the body and is converted to tyramine and that causes the headache. That's the theory. Except that people have discovered that that's really not the whole deal. We think that perhaps the body, uh, th that may be part of it, but we think that there's more to it. We think the body may just plain be reacting to the dairy protein and triggering a migraine. And it's not just aged cheeses. It can be any dairy protein. So mm -hmm. back to skim milk, low-fat yogurt, ice cream, all these things, and the non-aged cheeses too. So the only way to tell is to don't have it. It's to just not have it. And you will know because if, if you avoid your triggers, you're going to do, you're going to do better. Well, that's, I mean, so basically you're talking about doing like an elimination diet to yes. figure out. Oh yeah. You know, Yes, except one real quick thing. Uh, some people might think, all right, it's dairy, so I'm only going to eliminate dairy. But what if you have two or three triggers? What if it's dairy and eggs and 
something else. It's better to eliminate all the triggers simultaneously, and then you will know. So if I happen to have migraines, if anybody watching this has migraines, I would suggest that you go completely vegan, no animal products at all. And do that for a few weeks and see if the migraines just stop. They, they will for many people. If they do, you're finished. Stick with a, 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 a vegan diet and all the side effects are good ones. I mean, you're going to have good weight control, lower cholesterol, you're going to be happy. If they do not completely remit, it's conceivable that you have additional triggers. So if that's the case, I would suggest what, what, what I'm going to call an elimination diet. It's a, an experiment. It feels a little punishing, but, but you can do it. I wrote about this actually in a different book called Foods That Fight Pain, but I also have a little um, summary of it in The Cheese Trap, where uh, you eliminate all the common triggers and you're left with a really basic diet, where for a couple of weeks you're eating rice and a few cooked vegetables and not much anything else. And, you know, it's very limited, but you can do it. And then your migraines hopefully will go away. And then you add the foods back mm -hmm. one at a time every 48 hours. So I'm going to bring back bananas and then citrus fruits and then tomatoes and potatoes and whatever. You bring them in one at a time. And if one of them triggers a migraine, uh-uh, you know, take it out. If it doesn't, you keep it. Uh, you only have to do this once. But it is such, a, it's such an informative thing to do that it's – and by the way, you could do the same thing with, with rheumatoid arthritis. If you discover that white potatoes trigger your pain, good to know. So we've been talking a lot about cheese and dairy, but it's not the only thing that people can react to. You can react to lots of things. And, and, and they're not necessarily unhealthy things. You know, If you're allergic to strawberries, there's nothing wrong with strawberry. It's just that you're allergic to it and you can't have it. Well, what are some of the triggers in the plant-based world for migraines? Chocolate is one. And it can, <laughs> yeah. It can, yeah, it's starting to break your heart. It can be dark chocolate or it can be vegan chocolate. It can be from Switzerland. It can cost you $12 a bar. You know, it can be hand-rolled by monks, but you could still be, <laughs> <laughs> you can still react to it. Citrus mm. can be one. It could be wheat. It could be other gluten-containing right. foods, wheat, wheat, barley, rye. Could be tomatoes, could be could be potatoes. I myself have a little bit of joint pain from white potatoes. It's nothing serious, but if I don't have white potatoes, I, my joints are one hundred percent fine. Mm. But one day I'll wake up with a little grinding in my thumb joints, and I look at the instant soup I made yesterday, and it had potato starch in it. So uh. potatoes are fine. There's nothing wrong with them, but for some people they react. Was that because like they're part of like the nightshade family? Yeah, it could be. But what, what that means is that these are botanical relatives that, that have something that people are reacting to. But nightshades, that's potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant, some others. You may react to one and not others. Mm. So you got to kind of, have to, you sort of have to test them individually. Okay. Well, you mentioned arthritis. Do dairy products continue, contribute to arthritis? And can a diet for change my, that? Yes and yes. Uh, for many people, they do. Now, when, I, when I'm speaking of arthritis, there's more than one kind, but let me, let me focus on classic rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. If you look at the joint, it is inflamed. It is ugly looking. The lining of the joint is inflamed. Now, inflammation means the body is reacting to something. There's some protein that the body is troubled by, and it's triggering this inflammation to try to fight it. Well, what could that be? Dairy is a common one. And, and what, what I mean by this is when people get the dairy out, their arthritis improves or, or flat out goes away. Mm -hmm. And there is not a lot of research on it, but there is enough to be quite convincing that a person with rheumatoid arthritis should really give diet a try. And this goes way back to the 80s and 90s. Researchers started doing tests of vegan and vegetarian diets, finding that they do indeed help. And, and we did a study here, a small study, but we brought in a group of people with classic rheumatoid arthritis. We put them on vegan diets and, and you see two things. First of all, they, uh, well, there's quite a variability of response, but many people do feel better. Not all, but many. And not only do they feel better, but you think, well, that's all in their head. You know, it's, it's a healthy diet. You can do a blood test and you measure something called CRP, C-reactive mm -hmm. protein, which is a, and as you know, it's an uh, indicator of inflammation right. and it goes, so there, there is, it, it reduces. And so there is clearly something going on when you, when you take these 
out of the uh, out of the, the diet. The body is clearly cooling the inflammatory jets in a, in a good way. So, but but I encourage people don't take this on faith. Try it in your own life, and if you feel better, you can always bring the culprit foods back and see what happens, and then take them out again. And you can go back and forth and back and forth as many times as it takes to convince yourself that it's real. So don't take anything on faith of this type. Just try it and see what happens. Well, I'm just smiling about the C-reactive protein because when I went, when I first started this, I said to my doctor, I wanted to do a, a C-reactive protein test. And I said, I wanted to repeat it in six months. And she said, why? And I said, I want to see if there's changes. And she's like, in my 25 years of ed- medical experience, <laughs> I've never seen a change. It's not going to come down. And I said, humor me, <laughs> you know. It did come back down, but her response was probably a bad test the first time. You know, it is a funny thing because if it came down when they, if they gave you a drug and it came down with that, they would credit the drug. But if you did it with food, well, it's got to be, it's either a miracle. It's a lab error. We see this over my my own mother. I I don't know if I told you this story. My mother had a really high cholesterol level and she, she wouldn't go vegan for the longest time, but she eventually did. And her cholesterol dropped 70 or 80 points. And when, when she got this result, her doctor at the time was absolutely convinced it was a lab error. It couldn't be possible. And, and, but it's for the reason that you gave. It's because this doesn't happen. I've been working in this clinic for a long time. We've used lots of diets and nobody ever gets better. It's because the diet they are using is switch from beef to chicken, switch from whole milk to skim milk. These, these changes are so trivial that no wonder you don't see anything. But once you take the meat and the dairy and the eggs and you throw them in the wastebasket and you're eating vegetables and fruits and whole grains and beans, that's a big change for the body. The body is starting to heal. And these lab tests mm-hmm. change dramatically. And when we started to see type two diabetes go away. That, that just completely freaked out healthcare personnel um, that diabetes could go away. And, and it be, they became angry in, in some cases. They said, you can't tell a person with diabetes that their blood tests are normal. I said, well, wait a minute, it's their blood test. They, they have a right to know. No, once you got diabetes, you've always got diabetes. Maybe. But I have to say in the 10 to 15 years or so that we've been, been fighting that battle, I'm happy to say that now people are quite comfortable saying that diabetes can go away. It's a, it's a two-way street that it comes, it, it's, it's a trait. It's not a disease. It, it gets worse, it gets better. Um, and if you catch it early enough, it'll go away. So, so anyway, uh, you are not alone. Doctors have a hard time imagining that, that foods can really be that it's powerful. True. And, and they're not always. I mean, sometimes a person makes big changes and they don't see, see big results, but most of the time they do and it's quite impressive. Very impressive. Researchers from Australia's Monash University found a link between people with tendon problems and bad cholesterol. Could dairy be the culprit here too? Same kind of thing, I think, yes. That, that when, when you see people with chronic inflammation, and, and this is, by the way, not just everyday folks, but it can also be athletes, where athletes, they are straining their muscles, they're straining their tendons, their ligaments, and, and their whole body is really put through the ringer. And they need to get that inflammation cooled down mm-hmm. so, they can, so they can work out again, so, so that they're ready for the game. But if it doesn't cool down, then they just are never healthy enough to play. So, so what you said is, is right, that researchers in Australia, they happen to notice this peculiar pattern that if people had higher cholesterol levels, they had, they had uh, more, uh, um, more signs of inflammation. Mm-hmm. Um, orthopedic type inflammation. And yes, we do think that although there are many potential contributors, that dairy proteins set up the body for more inflammation. Now, I think we need more research in this area. We need more controlled studies. But on the other hand, you got one body. Now is a good time to just get the junk out and see for yourself yes. what the effect, effect may be. Many, many people have been doing this. In fact, not to belabor this, but Aaron Rodgers uh, playing for the Green Bay Packers, the cheese state, the, the cheese, <laughs> you know. the cheese hats. Yes, that's go, great. Go to the, listen, go to the stadium. It's all full of these cheese hats. You, you go through the airport in Milwaukee and you can't get to the baggage claim without somebody wanting to, you know, put one of these things on your head. You know, you want to fit in, right? So anyhow, he's playing for the Packers. And what is he? He's the, I mean, he's the star of the team. He's the quarterback. 
He says, I'm not eating dairy. No, no cheese, no, nothing during, during the season, at least. Why? Because he wants to extend his career. He wants to perform well. And you can't be all inflamed and performing well. Tom Brady, mm -hmm. New England Patriots. I mean, amazing, amazing quarterback. Whatever you think of him, he's a, he's a very talented player. Exact same thing. He says, look, I want, I, want to, I want to be able to play. And I want to extend my career. I want to play as long as I can, as well as I can, do the same thing. And get the dairy out of my diet, at least during the season. So other people, I mean, these are people where their you know, knees and ankles are worth millions of dollars. And so they've got the best physicians, the best medical care, and they are under intense scrutiny. And they have made these kinds of changes in their lives. And, and they are by no means the first. It started with um, distance runners. And Serena Williams had an inflammatory condition that was really goofing up her tennis play. And all these people say, like, get rid of the dairy. And in many cases, they go completely vegan. Not all of them do, but some of them go completely vegan. And they just, I mean, they're just, they're, they're just at the top of their game when they do that. It's true. It's true. And I saw it with my own son, who was a wrestler. And yeah. it, I saw it definitely in the competitions, because all the other kids would be eating cheese pizza they would make an announcement the cheese pizza has arrived you know and the kids would just go flock to it and i you know that i'm sorry go ahead but i, I would see him you know he, he first of all i wouldn't give him money to, to eat it <laughs> and i packed a cooler for him to eat out of and but you would see him go throughout the day because it's very intense i mean you're, you wrestle five times in a day and you're there all day long and his level of being able to compete with other other kids was just incredible and that's why i think he did so well is because he had the right fuel in his body the other kids would phase out his competitors so yeah yeah well that, that's really important you know first of all let's say i sit down and i have a cheese pizza and so you got a crust and you got the occasional sun-dried tomato and this big layer of yellow asphalt all over the top they call cheese that mm. cheese is <laughs> sounds great doesn't it that <laughs> cheese is 70 percent fat mostly saturated fat it, the molecules go into my blood. The blood starts to become more viscous, more thick. My blood flow slows down. The oxygenation to my muscles slows down. Right. The oxygenation to my brain slows down. I'm less reactive. I'm less strong. I've got less endurance. Okay, wait, rewind. I'll have my pizza, no cheese, my vegan pizza. Okay, there's some grain for carbohydrate that goes to glycogen that helps me with energy. There isn't any of that cheese to make my blood more viscous. My blood is now flowing. I'm oxygenating my brain, I'm oxygenating my muscles. We've been at this tournament for four and a half hours and I'm the one with energy. Right, um, and he was. So, so you, you, can, you can put diesel in your Ferrari if you want to, but you'd be way better off putting in the fuel that it is designed for. Right, absolutely. Well, people eating a, a plant-based diet, such as the, the islanders of Papua New Guinea, rarely had issues with acne. Okay. Once the diet then was westernized and the sad <laughs> diet came to be, acne became a huge problem. Why was this happening? We see that quite a lot in many, many cultures. I honestly don't know the reason why, but, I'll t I, uh, but we have a couple of pretty good explanations for it kind of more than one reason. The first reason is what we were talking about, that the dairy proteins can cause a little bit of inflammation. What is acne? Acne is little inflammatory eruptions in the skin. Right. That's one. We also know that acne is often at its worst during adolescence. Not always. I mean, you can have adult acne, but it very often flares up during adolescence, meaning that hormonal shifts mm -hmm. seem to trigger it. Mm. And other hormonal shifts at other times in life, uh, pregnancy and others can sometimes make the skin react a little bit. So, well, dairy has hormones in it. Right. And as we've talked about before, dairy causes our own hormones to get a little bit out of whack. Right. And through, through a variety of mechanisms. Once again, I encourage people not to give up their skepticism, but just give it a try. Get away from dairy. And what I, frankly, if somebody is watching this, and they got bad acne. What I would do is pull out the stops. Vegan. Right. Very low in fat. Don't add fats either because it may not be just the dairy. And not everybody's acne get, gets better, but many pe people do report that. So give it a shot and see what happens. So, and that's one of the things that I have, have seen with kids. Once, even if they do go vegan and they still have acne, once they get the fat out, 
because there's a lot of it in especially the the vegan world yeah. there's a lot of processed vegan foods and in, they replace a lot of that with fat in in those products so if you can get away from the processed foods then you know getting the, the fat down as well seems to help yeah. clear it up so i think that's right you know going from animal fat to vegetable fat it's a better quality of fat but going to basically no added fat is really, really helpful for many things. There are some natural oils, traces of them mm -hmm. in vegetables and fruits, but getting away from all that added grease, even if it's from a plant source, is a good idea. Excellent. What about type 1 diabetes? I mean, is there a relationship between young children consuming cow's milk and, and type 1 diabetes? There sure is, in at least in observational trials. This is an active area of investigation. But back in 1992, the New England Journal of Medicine reported this shocking finding. A group of researchers had taken a large group of kids. They were all newly diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And they looked for antibodies to dairy proteins. And they found them. And the proteins, the, the antibodies were apparently made in response to the dairy protein in the same way as... Mm -hmm. Uh, you touch poison ivy and your body will react with antibodies to it. In this case, they were reacting with antibodies to the cow's milk protein. And those same antibodies could attack and destroy their own insulin producing cells, causing the diabetes. At least that's what we think was happening. And these antibodies were found in every single child who had type 1 diabetes in wow. the study. Now, now, now um, I hasten to add a couple things. There's a genetic component to this. Some kids seem to be genetically predisposed, but you can have identical twins. They got the same genes. One of them gets diabetes, the other does not. So there is a role for what you're eating and exposure and so on. The second thing is that there may be also a role for viruses and other kinds of environmental exposures. So maybe two kids both have dairy and one gets the disease, one doesn't. So it's still a murky area, but there are some things we know for sure. There does seem to be some connection with dairy. Kids who are breastfed by mom, not by a cow, do better. Their risk of diabetes is less. So while the researchers are fighting it out, here's my suggestion. That women should avoid all animal products throughout pregnancy and during breastfeeding. Because when you consume milk, some of the milk proteins go into your breast milk and reach the child amazingly enough. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah, they do. Um, that was thought to be impossible. But we now know that some of the things you eat, well, I guess we've known for a long time, some things that mom eats get into her blood, yeah. get into her milk, and, and affect the kid. You'll see the child getting colicky and so forth because mom had a cup of coffee or chocolate or milk. Milk's a big one. So I, I don't know if we can prevent type 1 diabetes 100% but I would sure like to try. And if it's as easy as encouraging breastfeeding, right. um, then you're going to have a whole lot of other benefits too. And there is zero reason for exposing your child to cow's milk. Well, I grew up drinking milk as a kid. I mean, I was part of that, you know, post my parents got married right after world war II, And, you know, right. we had five kids and all of us grew up drinking, you know, maybe orange juice for breakfast. There was no soda in our house, but we had milk, milk for lunch, milk for dinner, and we would mm -hmm. float in our house by the gallon. But right. why don't we see, like, I didn't know anybody with type 1 diabetes growing up. Mm -hmm. Why don't we see more of that? It's not terribly common still. And even if it is an autoimmune, well, it is an autoimmune, there's no question it is. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of how does it play out. What I mean by that is there is no question that in type 1 diabetes, the insulin producing cells, they're called the beta cells of the pancreas. Right. They have been attacked by antibodies that have killed them. And those antibodies are arising in the body in response to something. And it okay. could be dairy protein, it could be a virus, it could be something else. We know that for sure. And the question is what's doing it? My suggestion is that we avoid the dairy products, avoid animal products in general, and just see if you can prevent that from happening. But but you're saying, okay, wait, we didn't see a lot of it. It may be that there are certain times where the exposure is riskier. It, uh, it may be that there are certain times when the pancreatic cells are more vulnerable than others. We don't really know all the pieces of the puzzle. 
But we do know, as I said, that breastfeeding kids are at less risk. And we also know that as milk consumption went up in the post-World War II period, type 1 diabetes went up as well. Mm. Uh, type 1 diabetes is actually rising quite rapidly. And, and it, by the way, it didn't rise prior to World War II. It was just kind of percolating along. And then after World War II, everybody comes home, happy days are here again. Everyone's got milk and ice cream and cheese vroom, going right through the roof. Mm. And what's cheese? That's milk with the proteins concentrated. Right. And so type 1 diabetes has been following that curve. And you see it in, in other countries, not just the U.S., you see it in other countries, too. So that if it's rising, that means it's not genetic or, or not entirely right. genetic. There is something environmental going on. And the biggest part of our environment is our diet. So while researchers are fighting about this, be safe. Be safe to your own family. And it really makes sense to follow a healthy plant-based diet. Wow. Well, what about, you, you talked about type 1. What about type 2 diabetes? Can this be reversed with diet? Uh, oh, yeah. And no, by the way, with type 1, I did not mean to say it could be reversed. With type 1 diabetes, I think it could be prevented, at least theoretically. Right. In type 1 diabetes, though, once the cells are dead, I, I mean, once the pancreatic beta cells that make insulin type have been one. destroyed by this autoimmune re response, I don't have a way to reverse it. Mm -hmm. That said, a vegan diet is still the way to go. A low-fat vegan diet if a person has type 1 diabetes, the assault of the diabetes is the assault on the blood vessels. So you don't want any cholesterol in your diet. You don't want any animal fat in your diet. You want to protect your blood vessels 100% so that you protect the blood vessels to the eyes and to the kidneys and to the legs and to the heart. And then you can live a normal life despite the fact that you've got type 1 diabetes. The other thing is for reasons I cannot fully explain, when a person with type 1 diabetes goes on a low-fat vegan diet, their insulin requirement goes way down. And you think, how could that be? And I honestly don't know why, but you see it all the time. So even though we can't reverse type 1 diabetes, I strongly encourage people with type 1 to follow a low-fat vegan diet, just like with type 2. Now, type 2 diabetes is not caused by an antibody reaction killing off the beta cells, it appears to start with insulin resistance, which is fat building up in the muscle cells, mm -hmm. fat building up in the liver cells. When the fat builds up in the cell, the insulin that arrives at the cell is trying to trigger the cell to accept glucose. All that fat is goofing it up. The insulin can't work so well anymore when this cell that's loaded with fat particles. And so you're insulin resistant. The pancreas then says, gee, this is like terrible. I can't get the, the, you know, the glucose isn't going in the cell. I'll make more insulin and eventually we'll just drive the glucose into the cell and that will happen. But the pancreatic beta cells eventually give up and your blood sugar starts to rise. And the problem is the buildup, the, the original problem, mm -hmm. we believe, is the buildup of all that fat inside the cell. So can I reverse it? Sure. The way to reverse it is to get the animal products out of your diet. There's no animal fat left. Right. Keep the oils, re the oils really low and the fat inside the cells will start to dissipate. And then your insulin will start to work better. And if I catch it early enough, the diabetes is gone. If I catch it really late when the pancreas has kind of been wearing out, I might not be able to reverse it, but you'll still do a lot better than you were doing wow. before. Wow. Well, Neil, I have to tell you, I think after this whole series, you've killed any addiction. Or, or I think you've killed all my cravings for cheese. So thank you, because I'm going to hear your voice in my head now. So, Well, well, if, if that's the case, when you next see a little bit of cheese, I do want you to know there is one part of it that is still okay. And that's, that's the holes, the holes inside the Swiss cheese. Perfectly fine. <laughs> Good to know. Well, thank you so much for taking the time for this series. I appreciate it. And I know you've helped so many other people. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for including me.